Hi, I'm Devin Stewart from Carnegie Council, and I'm here today with Ian Bremer from Eurasia Group. He's president of Eurasia Group. And today we're talking about his company's top 10 political risks for 2017 and their ethical implications. Ian, so good to have you back at Carnegie Council. Good to see you, Devin. Yeah. So your report is concluding that the world has entered a geopolitical recession. Yeah. Is it time to panic? Are we going to be okay? It's time to worry. Uh, I mean, I'm an upbeat guy, as you know, um, and uh, I've run the firm for 19 years now. This is, without question, the most negative uh, geopolitical forecast that we've ever given. Um, economic recessions happen pretty frequently. We recognize a boom cycle, a bust cycle. Uh, geopolitical recessions are much longer uh, in duration. About how long? Well, I mean, the last one we had was World War II. Right. And since then, we've had the Pax Americana, first by ourselves, then the Cold War, us versus the East Bloc, and then by ourselves again after 1991. And it's now over. Um, and uh, it would have come to an end if Hillary had won, but it would have been over a longer period of time, and it would have been more gradual. Mm -hmm. And the Americans would have had a role uh, at the table. Uh, in what it would look like. But with, with, the, with the victory of, of Donald Trump, the shock victory of Donald mm -hmm. Trump, which I certainly had not expected, and I think very few of us did uh, a year ago, um, the, um, this geopolitical recession happens immediately, and uh, the world reacts to the unilateralism, the uh, unwillingness of the United States. Um, to take on responsibilities of global leadership. So is that what a geopolitical recession is? Is it, is it a lack of leadership? And what are the consequences? The geopolitical recession is um, the unwinding of the old global order. I see. So it's a transition phase. Yeah. And uh, it's an interregnum. Um, and uh, it clearly is going to last for some time. Um, but we are in it now. Uh, is it a time of great uh, of danger? Well. Uh, so there are two ways I can answer that. Uh, the first is that um, a global economic recession, uh, as we saw in 2008, really affects everybody's economies. A geopolitical recession clearly um, affects a lot of countries a lot more than it affects the United States. I mean, we don't have an arms race going on in the Western Hemisphere. We don't have border confrontations mm -hmm. or conflicts with Mexico or Canada. We don't have a refugee challenge. We've talked about that before. We don't have a significant terrorist threat the way the Europeans do, the Middle East does, the Asians with border issues, with arms race, all of that kind of thing. So um, in that regard, um, you can easily imagine that the Dow, which is right now hovering just at 20,000 mm -hmm. records almost every day, and all of the enthusiasm for uh, the potential of additional U.S. growth, uh, that is consistent with a geopolitical recession such as we're, we're entering. On the other hand, um, if you had asked me at any point in the last 10 years, did I think that uh, war between major powers mm -hmm. was possible mm -hmm. uh, in the near horizon, I would say no. And I can't say that anymore. I don't think it's going to happen, but it's possible. Uh, because between, of the, between which powers? Well, the, first of the erosion of trust between major governments and the uh, dissolution of strength of major multilateral institutions and architecture means that the ability, the guardrails are off geopolitically, so mm -hmm. that if you have a mistake, if you have a crisis, if you have an accident and it escalates, it's harder to contain it. And so... Um, like, a, like a nuclear reaction. For example, uh, I could see confrontation with North Korea much more likely in this environment, which clearly would have a disastrous economic set of conflict impacts. With, conflict with North Korea or over North Korea? Either. Uh, I mean, when Trump tweets uh, that the North Koreans will be stopped from developing nuclear capability to hit uh, the west coast of the U.S., there are only a couple ways he can accomplish that, right? He can either directly attack them uh, or he can put serious sanctions on the Chinese 
uh, to ensure that they cut the North Koreans off because they want, they're not going to consider it otherwise. And either way... What about a trade embargo around, around North Korea? Well, I mean, it can't be... We're not going to impose it by ourselves. We would need the Chinese on board. Absolutely. They're not going to support that. It's been floated, though, right? I mean, that is... By the Americans, but not by the Chinese. They're not going to go along with it. They're not going to go with it. So, again, we have to look at the art of what's possible. And so either he's throwing up a red line that he's going to fail on like Obama did on Syria, right? Yeah which doesn't seem to be the way Trump wants to govern, or he really thinks that he can get this done, in which case there's a greater chance of confrontation. Now, look, I mean, you know, it's possible he just backs down. It's possible that in the worst case, the Americans and Chinese still have clearer heads, and I think that those things are likely. But, you know, all I'm saying is we're in an environment where clearly the geopolitics are far more dangerous. In fact, I would say for the first time in my career, that I believe that the principal risks to the global economy now for the near-term future are political, mm -hmm. which has never been true. Rather than and, economic. And never been true in my history. Never been true. So For 20 years you've been... You've been I've been a political... I ran the firm for 19. I've been a political scientist since, what, 86? So, I mean, that's like 30 years. That's yeah. a long time. So, yeah, I mean, that that's at least feels like a data point, right? Just, it, it is. Uh, Ian, speaking of... <clears throat> Obama in Syria and yeah. the red line. Um, it happens also to be the end of the eight years of, of the Obama administration. Yeah. Since this is Carnegie Council for the Ethics for Ethics and International Affairs, let's talk about Obama's moral legacy. How do you how do you assess his his legacy from an ethical lens? I mean, you know, think about human rights, think about international norms. On the on the on the whole, is it, is it a positive? Is it a negative? Is it neutral? How do you how do you look at that? I think it's a failure. You know? um, and I hate to say that because um, Obama has held himself with to a very high ethical standard professionally and personally mm -hmm. with his family, with his business friends and colleagues. We've had virtually no scandals of any sort or right. conflicts of interest under Obama. I mean, the IRS scandal is probably the biggest one in Ohio that he clearly wasn't aware of himself. Um, we see a president that cares deeply about the way people are treated, that cares deeply um, about uh, trying to create more equality and diversity and harmony in the United States and globally. Sure. And yet, if you take a dispassionate view of the United States that his legacy leaves, as well as the world that his legacy leaves, what you see is a very, a much more fractured world. Uh, what you see is a foreign policy that is largely in tatters, where the United States is not only weaker, uh, our alliances are uh, more challenged, and most of his foreign policies uh, leave a failed legacy. So this failed legacy has contributed to the geopolitical recession that you're report talks about? I think that uh, there are many structural factors that lead to the geopolitical recession. One is the Trump election, mm -hmm. uh, which Obama has some responsibility for, but certainly not most of it. Uh, one is the rise of China. One is the willingness of Putin to undermine Obama directly and the United States more broadly. One is the weakness of Europe. Mm -hmm. One is the implosion of the Middle East. Yeah. But clearly, um, Obama has contributed. Um, to that geopolitical recession. I mean, you and I have talked in the past about how I believed that his principal positive foreign policy legacy was going to be the pivot to Asia and the successful conclusion sure. of a major multilateral trade deal, the biggest in decades, 40% of the global economy, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He failed. failed. He failed. And <laughs> that has done lasting damage to the ability of the American allies across Asia and to a degree in Latin America to look to the United States and say that you can count on this country. And I can say that with allies around the world before Trump was elected. And that's, again, it's a true sadness because Trump is analytically so sharp. And yet it turns out that he's not much of a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was, look, it wasn't an easy time. He came in with a massive economic recession. 
uh, which he was able to help dig the Americans out of in a serious so way. So Obama's analytically oh, sharp. Oh, yeah. Obama, Obama's yeah. analytically incredibly yeah. sharp. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yet he's not much of a leader. And uh, and that has uh, gotten him in massive trouble. The Russians have run rings around sure. him. This is the world's 14th largest economy, smaller than Canada. How could that happen? Um, the idea that the Russians could engage mm. in systematic hacks to delegitimize the U.S. election, and Obama did nothing because he didn't want to be seen as partisan. I mean, I'm sorry, but... Uh, too polite? Uh, you know, uh, maybe too polite and too political, but mm. the fact is, if you are a leader of the free world and you are a head of state, I am sorry, but American national security comes a little bit before you, the perception of you being partisan sure. on behalf of Hillary Clinton. This was a, this was a massive failure. And, and this is, um, I, I think, uh, completely on the president. Uh, again, someone I personally respect and admire a great deal and yet ultimately just didn't get it done. Ian, um, I want to look at five of your ten risks mm. and ask you a couple of ethical questions on each one. Uh, I want to go through counting down from five to one. Uh, so looking at risk five, you're, you're looking at the role and the impact of technology in the Middle East. So technology is both emancipatory as well as destabilizing, right? And that's true everywhere, right? So when you're thinking about technology's impact on the Middle East, I suppose in general and in the world, how do you, how do you sort of get your mind around the, the overall net impact of technology in terms of advancing human rights, advancing uh, liberal values and, and, and um, democratic govern governance. Well, you break apart all of the different aspects of technology and you look at what it means to the social contract, you look at what it means to the legitimacy of government, stability of states, inequality, I mean, all of those issues. It's very clear that you can do this with globalization too, right? I mean, everyone thought for many decades globalization's awesome, it's rising all the boats, you know, the rise of the res, that it's, right. all, it's all true. Right. And yet, you know, what we see in the United States and Europe is that there were very large numbers of American European citizens that were completely left behind and they can buy cheaper goods at Walmart, but if they don't have jobs, they don't really care very much about that. Now, that is a clear um, failing. Uh, of, of leaders to uh, effectively um, anticipate and react to globalization. Now, when we talk about technology, you have similar issues. And of course, technology has allowed uh, literally over a billion people to be taken out of poverty globally in the last generation. And that's the most extraordinary accomplishment that humanity has achieved in <coughs> our short period on this planet. So that's great. Yeah. But in the Middle East, you are not taking people out of poverty right now with technology. In the Middle East, you have destroyed their ability to generate wealth through taking oil out of the ground, through technology, through vacuum technology. Right. Now the swing producers of the U.S., not Saudi Arabia, in five years. That's true. Um, you have a whole bunch of people on the Internet. They're mostly angry. They're mostly very dissatisfied. And polarized. Polarized and very dissatisfied with And they can governments. find each other. They are... More, They're angry and they can find each other. I mean, in the United States, you know, it's, you, you can get on MSNBC or you can get on Fox or, you know, you can get on Breitbart even, but the fact is most Americans are pretty apathetic politically. Um, where in the Middle East, <coughs> you know, it's, if you're not doing Al Jazeera, it's because you're with your tribe or you're with your sect, and that is clearly much more destabilizing. So, I mean, for all of these reasons, technology is really driving a lot of instability. And in the, Middle net, East. the net impact, how do you, is it, is it sort of a balance? It's overwhelmingly uh, negative. Overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly. Well, I mean, I you, mean you, you, you know, economists you know, always argue that, you know, technology is the salvation, right? It is the salvation. Which you're saying on the whole it is destabilizing. Globally, uh, technology, well, let's put it this way. Um, technology is a, is a mag, is a, it's, a, it's a megaphone, it's a multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, technology has, on balance, been very positive for most people in the world, and yet there are certain parts of the world that have done incredibly badly as a consequence. The Middle East is the one that you really focus on. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you talk to people that project technology out 30 to 50 years, on the one hand, you've got folks like Raymond Kurzweil, the, um, sure. the transhumanist who believe that a singularity is coming and we're effectively going to have this rapture as we all merge with um, artificial right. intelligence. Sounds great. On the other hand, you've got Stephen Hawking um, mm -hmm. and Elon Musk and others who believe that this is the end of humanity. So you come down on 
the latter. No, I'm no. I'm telling you that technology um, has always had people that believe that it's progressive and people that mm -hmm. believe that it's not. And mm -hmm. my view is that until we get to the digital outcome, pardon that pun, of zero versus one, right now it's actually a more mixed story. It's on balance more positive than negative, but the negatives mm. in some parts of the world are very significant. And you know, we could have written the top risk about terrorism in Syria and mm -hmm. Yemen and all of that. We could have, but those are headlines. And sure. I'm more interested with the top risk in helping people understand why is it that the Middle East is falling apart? Why is it that it. the Westphalian mm -hmm. system is unwinding? And, and you know, the fact is that technology is speeding these processes up very dramatically in this part of the world. That's why we can't fix it. Especially the Middle East. So Especially on the, the whole, East. very, very dangerous for the Middle East. Yeah. Let's, let's go to risk number four. Ian, you talk about little incentive for governments to reform right. for a variety of reasons. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And this is in all regions of the world. Of the world, yeah. Uh, if, if, if governments are going to do nothing, essentially, don't they risk fostering more populism or even backlash against their own regimes? Well, I mean, in some cases, mm -hmm. the reason countries don't do much is precisely because they want to, they feel like they need to support populism. So Merkel has been this you know, sort of great advocate of austerity in Germany and more broadly. But with her election coming up, she feels like she has to be looser around that. Yeah. We know in the United States that when you have an election period for the last 9, 12, sometimes 18 months, nothing gets done. So right. there's that. There's also some leaders that are just too damn weak to get anything done. Sure. They don't have the political capital. And in some cases, I mean, frankly, uh, they've done an awful lot. And now they're digesting in the case of India, in the case of Mexico. Mexico, the foreign process in Mexico around telecom, around energy, uh, fiscal reform, political reform, actually pretty breathtaking. They failed on education. Uh, but generally speaking, they've done a really solid job. But now it's kind of his popularity has gone way down. And he just, you know, that's it for a while, at least until the next round of elections, 2018. And so in your report, you're saying that the, the, uh, when governments do, don't do a lot of reform, right. investors don't know what to do with their money. I mean, I guess what I'm asking, is there a more of a, a, a dangerous or political um, uh, outcome that could happen from governments sort of resting on their laurels? It, it does mean that um, countries start looking less sustainable long term, right? Mm -hmm. when, when countries that, when governments that need to reform don't have the political capital to do so, they tend to take tactical short term decisions, which means they tend right. to eat their seed crops right. as opposed to investing in longer term growth. So, you know, what that means is that the longer term outlook, again, not a surprise in a period of geopolitical recession, mm -hmm. starts looking uh, more fractious, more unstable. Now, you mentioned Merkel, um, which happens to be risk number three. Right. You're, you're assuming or predicting or she will win. probably she's going to win. Yeah. Um, we think we're pretty sure this is going to happen. And, because they don't have the economic hollowing out of their middle class mm -hmm. that the U.S. and the other Europeans do. It's the structure of the EU that really makes populism less of sure. an issue in Germany. Sure, sure. And um, what I found interesting is Merkel sort of reminded Trump that the U.S.-German relationship is built on values. Values, right? Yes. Uh, so do you think that Merkel, a, weak, a weakened Merkel, can defend liberal values in the face of illiberal regimes no. all around. No. No, I mean this is I mean if anything, twenty seventeen is, you know, much more volatile for me from a geopolitical risk perspective, but from the perspective of the Carnegie Council, twenty seventeen has to be truly dispiriting because it is precisely the death of the liberal international order that we are now seeing. <laughs> this country has just elected a president that believes that American exceptionalism is not a thing. That is why he is prepared to build a relationship with Russia, because it's transactional. He sure. just wants to get a deal done. Um, and the Germans reacted to that. Merkel did not congratulate Trump uh, and say, hey, I'm your buddy. It wasn't like Abe flying over and giving him a golf club from Japan. Right. In Germany, it was, I will look forward to working with you as long as you continue to uphold the common values that have mattered for our mutual relationship over the decades. And the fact is that that's a very unusual welcome for the German Chancellor to you know, the most important ally, but it shows you just how far the U.S. has moved. 
It is dispiriting, but we're, we have our work cut out for us. Okay. Right. <clears throat> risk number two is, uh, and it's kind of conflated with risk number one. Yes, it is. Uh, <clears throat> risk number two is the possibility of, of China overreacting to a, a, a number of triggers that could possibly take place. They, those include the Trump uh, uh, China policy, uh, conf conflict over Taiwan, South China Sea, right. uh, North Korea, obviously. <clears throat> Do you think that interdependence between China and the United States could have a pacifying effect and kind of control uh, the level of conflict that, that, that could take place? It certainly should. Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. I am happy that the uh, likeliest place of confrontation for Trump on becoming president is not a country like Russia or Iran, mm -hmm. where you could imagine them really upsetting the apple cart but as a country, because they're not as interdependent with the U.S., than a country like China, where the Chinese will be highly aware mm. that they are. Now, let's keep in mind, Trump is an enormously unorthodox individual to be the President of the United States, and he has mm. shown on multiple occasions, and with appointments, that he is prepared to give the Chinese the what for, on strategic issues and economically. While China this year has a leadership transition, very big, every five years, the party congress sure. in the fall. And so if there's ever a time when mm -hmm. Xi Jinping must show strength in responding to a threat domestically or internationally, it's this year. Right. Now, that does mean that there's a likely to be a level of confrontation between these two countries. We've seen a taste of it already in China's reactions, military and economic, to some of Trump's statements as president-elect. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't it also be possible that Xi Jinping might want to especially avoid risk or, or conflict during this time? Uh, yes, he'd like could, to avoid it. could go it. either way, right? He, I mean, will, he would like to avoid it unless he's pushed, and he's going to be pushed. Do you think his leeway is, is, is wider? No. Now that the, no. I think his leeway is, is, is more limited. I think, in other words, okay. that this is a time when Xi Jinping absolutely would not be looking to cause trouble with the U.S. Sure. But if trouble finds him, he's going to hit back Heart. It's going to be forced. To Can't show weakness. And, and so, look, I, I think that there is a possibility that, uh, you know, Trump gets himself in trouble. He raises a bunch of economic issues against the Chinese. He takes measures to hit Chinese companies, hit Chinese currency, that kind of thing. He gets aggravated on North Korea. The Chinese hit him back. There's a big market hit to both countries. And then Trump finds religion, recognizes, hey, this is a bad idea. Uh, and the Chinese are strong enough yeah. and mature enough after the leadership transition that they're prepared to reach out. Now, Trump is the kind of guy like Nixon could, that could actually make a move to China. I mean, you could sure. actually see a G2 after a crisis. Huh. You know, longer term with Trump. It's possible. In other words, you know, one of the interesting things about Trump. The so called condominium is not dead. The this, variance this of the breadth of potential outcomes under Trump over the medium term is vastly greater than they would have been under Hillary. Sure. There's much more downside, but there's also surprising upside, right? But in, in the near term, 2017, which is what this report is about, yep. clearly US China is going to be more poorly managed. Let's go and to it's the most important bilateral relationship in the world. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's fin finally get to risk number one, yeah. which is independent America. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned this possibility in your 2015 book, Superpower, yeah. as a possible outcome yeah. for uh, an America that kind of looks within and builds itself back up and could possibly even lead by example. Yes. And that's the positive way of looking at it. Um, you also mentioned that it's a shift away from liberal, liberal values toward the core American value of, of independence, right, uh, and autonomy, right. Um, you know, could this actually, I mean, I, I sense that you, your, your views have might have evolved over time about this possibility of an American foreign policy looking more as an independent one, um, whatever the case. Um, might it not be so bad after all? I mean, is there an upside? And, 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 and then uh, on the other side of the coin, yeah. what's, what's the worst case scenario? The, 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 there is a potential upside, absolutely. And the potential upside is uh, largely for the US, right? I mean, the reason why I never liked independent America, but nonetheless, I eventually recommended it. It was mm -hmm. my least favorite of my options for the US so in least, foreign policy. Least bad. Least favorite, but in some ways least bad because mm -hmm. I believed 
In a world where Americans increasingly were discontented with globalization, were discontented with the global sheriff role, and in a world that was becoming more G zero like because of China, Russia, the Middle East, Europe getting weaker, uh, Europe getting weaker, Russia, Europe, China moving in different direction, Middle East falling apart, that I thought that independent America was the foreign policy that we were most likely to be able to articulate and execute on. Sure. Where we've seen under Obama, Obama can articulate indispensability, but cannot execute on it. And that's so not purely was, his fault. Was that money ball? Was that the, the middle road? I Obama think no. Or? I think that Obama was talking a great game of all of these things that you know Assad must go and Russia must leave Ukraine and you know we're going to build the Middle East after the Arab Spring and democracy is going to bloom and of course none of it worked. So and he wanted to be ind indispensable. He wanted to be indispensable and he was incapable of doing it and the people weren't behind him and the international environment was too hard. So, you know, the funny thing is a lot of what Trump says on foreign policy, like, you know, is NATO really fit for purpose if they don't want to pay for it? That's, a, that's something we can execute on, you know? And uh, the idea um, that uh, the United States, you know, the pivot to Asia is, you know, ultimately not sustainable because China is going to be a lot larger is also something I get. The, here's the problem with Trump. Here's the worst case scenario. Well, it's not the worst case scenario. The worst okay. case scenario is war. Um, but the likely scenario is that um, Trump has a problem leading by example. Mm -hmm. That he does all of the international independent America stuff. But what's critical for independent America working is that other countries see that the United States is such a model as a country itself right. that it aspires to be like the U.S. Well, that implies, that implies a really professional and competent cabinet. Mm -hmm. And he has, he has appointed some people that that is true. He has appoint, uh, appointed some that are literally the worst and most unfit that have ever been in these positions. Um, it implies that a United States which internally celebrates its diversity, celebrates all of the values that America was truly made great by, and that wasn't about let's disparage, you know, sort of Mexican immigrants as rapists and murderers. It's not about we think the Muslims have a problem in terms of their religion. America was the great melting pot. That Trump is not leading by example in that regard. And right. the conflict of interest that we see through keeping the Trump organization, that feels more like South Korea or, you know, sort of even China than it feels like the United States, which was entrepreneurship and free market, not your companies have to be patriotic and so does your media. So I worry mm. that even though uh, he has managed to tap into a deep-seated populism with very legitimate reasons behind it on America's role in the world, that his ability to get it done in the U.S. is an open question. But final point on this, let's keep in mind that he does have a Republican House and Senate, and he is clearly someone that wants to use his bully pulpit to create jobs. Now, you know, if we get a big infrastructure bill and we reduce corporate taxation and he gets corporates to put a lot of jobs in the U.S., you know, even though he himself is a very damaged leader. Mm -hmm. It could well be that America as an economy is much more attractive going forward. And if that's true, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately the U.S.-China relationship won't deteriorate so much because the Chinese will be pragmatic and say, hey, you got to bet on these guys. Right. But there's a <laughs> lot of risk around that. And that's the point. The final question, Ian, um, looking to the future, big question, big picture thing. You've been looking at political cycles all around the world right. for 30 years. Yeah. Um, we're, si we're seeing, you know, you, you basically, I think you put it, uh, the liberal, liberal global order is dead, uh, and we're seeing the rise of illiberalism. Right. Can and many other things. We're and many other things. Hybrid. Many yeah. other things. Yeah. <clears throat> Very complicated. Uh, will liberalism make a comeback? Is it, is it a pendulum? Will, uh, will, will it come back? I don't know. I don't know, and, and I don't know in part because the role of technology globally. I mean, globalization was created um, for, uh, and its supply chains um, and its immigration patterns were created uh, because the global marketplace was about labor making capital work. Right. Um, with technology, that's going away. Uh, we are uh, going to not need global supply chains anymore. 
um, and you're going to focus much more on um, you know your domestic markets and your domestic consumption because mm -hmm. you'll have automation and AI and 3D manufacturing and all this stuff just completely changes. So it is not clear to me in that environment to what extent states are empowered and can be more authoritarian or individuals are empowered and we end up with more decentralization and more engagement of people. Right. Uh, I think that, that there's a lot to play for there. And there's, on the one hand, politics have never been in our lifetimes so dangerous. On the other hand, technology has never given us tools that are so empowering. Mm -hmm. And that provides an awful lot of uncertainty and it makes a lot of people fearful. Ian, uh, thank you so much for coming back to yeah. Carnegie Council pleasure, and, and uh, sharing your report with us and uh, hope to see you again next year. Definitely. Good to see you, Jim.